This morning's topic is where is God? A couple of interesting notes before I get there, though. Because that song was performed by Eddie Watkins, Jr., who was a very prominent musician in the Motown era. And he is currently the musical director of the Unity Church that I attend. Oh, wow. And last year I went to something called a Posse Conference, which is a musical conference of all from around the world of Unity musicians and others, ministers and other people, who attend this massive conference. It was in Tampa. And I met Daniel Neymar, the writer of that song, person. He's a lovely man. So it was a very exciting thing that I went through. Anyway, where is God? It was interesting that this morning you started your theological discussions because that this is right in keeping with what I'm going to talk about. Um, if we listen and watch television, what it presents to us, we see violence, political discord, war, war, disease, and all manner of lack, conflict, and strife. And we can make an argument that this has always been so. So we can ask the question, does God exist? Does God exist? And if so, where is God? How can the God let the world continue to be in such a state? And I'm going to talk this morning. I want to explore these questions, and I'm going to speak from my own spiritual experience this morning. So I don't ask that you accept what I have to say because I'm saying it. I don't ask that of anybody. I simply ask that you suspend resistance and be, have an open mind and be willing to accept, be willing to just be open to what I say as possibly being true. Okay? And consider it. First of all, I firmly believe that God does exist. A God. The word God is a little troublesome to me, given my background. And I won't go into it, but given my background, it's a little troublesome to me because it suggests a Santa Claus in the sky type figure, which I don't believe that's what God is. I don't believe in God as a person or an entity, but as an all-pervasive and creative presence or intelligence and power. I prefer words like spirit and presence. Though the word God is not a bad word, it was derived from Proto-Germanic and Proto-Indo-European roots, meaning to call or invoke or that which is invoked, which is really keeping what I want to talk about. I believe when we look around at nature, the evidence of divine intelligence and design abounds. We can look at intelligence running through creation. I remember being in school and looking at the organization of cells, or uh, yes, cells in the leaf, and how organized it was, and thinking, hmm, that's interesting. I've learned since that uh, DNA builds from the lower forms of life to the what we consider higher forms of life. We contain within ourselves the same DNA as a frog, and much more but it's the same thread of DNA built on. That's divine intelligence to me. So I think we see that everywhere. We see peace and harmony throughout nature. Now we can say, well, a, a, a lion attacks a gazelle and kills it. Yes, it does, but if it didn't, there would be too many gazelles in the world. And it's the balance of nature, and it is part of a food chain, and it is, in its own way, a grander scheme of harmony. Um, what science has revealed to us more recently does suggest all of this. Scientists are now saying, you know, that science used to, scientists used to say, oh, I don't believe in God. Now they say, you know what? More evidence of things we can't explain sort of suggests there's something going on out there, or in here, or where, everywhere. What do we see when we look at the world? What do we see when we look at nature? If we elevate our perspective, we see it as being intelligent and creative, nature. We also cannot fail to perceive the inherent attributes of beauty, harmony, balance, order, wholeness, abundance, abundance, grains of sand, the number of fleas and insects in the world. Just a quantity, 
there's something like five quintillion, quintillion insects in the world. They outnumber us by, so there's abundance. Peace and love. And if you take people out of the equation, as I did when I was a child, when I was a little girl, my family was not a great place. Um, hugely dysfunctional, an emotionally disturbed mother, an a emotionally remote father, and a lot of issues in our family. I'll just leave it at that. So I, I lived out in what was country at the time. I lived, we had 15 acres in uh, South Florida, believe it or not. It's not that way anymore. But we had um, a little pond in the back, and we had lots of land, and horses, and cows, and chickens, and ducks, and turkeys. And, uh, uh. So I would sit out there and feed the fish in the pond with the dog sitting next to me, and birds flying over my head and whatnot. Look around me at the world. And I'm this little nine, ten-year-old girl. And I'm looking at the world going, it's perfect. It's perfect. The sun is shining. The clouds are beautiful. The sky is beautiful. Everything is great. But back in the house, where there are people. Hmm. So, if we take people off the planet, everything's beautiful. The planet spins, the sun shines, rain comes down, flowers grow. It's all beautiful and wonderful. Where's the variable? Hmm. Maybe, maybe even at that age, think about what what is God? I was going to the church. So where is God then? My belief is that God is everywhere. Everywhere. The major religions teach us that God is everywhere present, all-knowing, and all-powerful. Omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. If that's true, can there be an adversarial power to that? Where would it be? I asked that question when I was in a Baptist church, and they shoved me to the sky and never <laughs> answered it. I said, where could the devil be if God is everywhere? Hmm. It didn't make sense to me. It still doesn't make sense. So, that raises a lot of questions, though. Because if God is everything, if there was nothing, null and void, and then everything was created, whether it's a big bang or whatever the mechanism was for creation, what was it created out of? Nothingness? There's no such thing as no thingness. There is only spirit. So we are incarnated spirit. The pebbles are spirit. The air I breathe is spirit. We just have something a little extra called self-consciousness and choice, which makes us rather powerful in our world. I'll get back to that. Ernest Holmes who was the founder of religious science, which is the discipline that I, I learned in and had my spiritual buddy blossoming in, um, started a school in 1926 through his, he came out of the Calvinistic um, New England, and he wanted to, to teach people how to apply spiritual principles. He wanted not to start a religion, which he ended up doing, but he didn't want to do that. He wanted just to teach people wherever they came from, whatever church they belonged to, some spiritual tools to carry with them and adapt to their framework, their religious framework. So, he wrote several books, however. And this book called, This Thing Called Life, he wrote in 1943. You can think about what the world was doing at the time. And he wrote, the world, this is still true today, the world is crying out for God. Lost in the canyons of disillusionment where the trail runs out and stops against granite burials that wall, barriers that wall us in, we cry, why hast thou forsaken me? The answer to our need lies not in God's willingness, but in our willingness to accept and our ability through faith to recognize the divine presence as the great reality. The power of God within us is like a sleeping giant which must be awakened that it may spring into action. So, this brings me to an old Hindu legend. There was a time in the Hindu legend 
when all men were gods, but they were so abused their divinity that Brahman, the chief god, decided to take it away from men and hide it where they would never again find it. Where to hide it became a big question. When the lesser gods were called into council to consider this question, they said, well, we will bury man's divinity deep in the earth. But Brahman said, no, that will not do, for man will dig deep in the earth and find it. Then they said, well, we will sink his divinity into the deepest ocean. But again, Brahman replied, no, not there, for many will learn to dive into the deepest of waters and will search out the ocean bed and they will find it. Then the lesser god says, we will take to the top of the highest mountains and leave it there and hide it there. But, but again, Brahma replied, no, for man will eventually climb every hot mountain on earth. He will be sure someday to find it, take it up again for himself. Then the lesser gods gave up and concluded, we do not know where to hide it, for there seems to be no place on earth or in the sea that man will not eventually reach. Then Brahma said, here is what we will do with man's divinity. We will hide it deep down in man himself, for he will never think to look at it there. Ever since then, the legend concludes man's been going up and down the earth, climbing, digging, diving, exploring, searching for something that is already within himself. And for some. And ourselves. So. Ernest Holmes founded what he founded on this concept of God being everywhere present and most importantly within us. And that is my belief. He said in his, he, get, he put out a declaration of principles and his first declaration was, we believe in God, the almighty spirit, the living spirit, almighty, one indestructible, absolute, and self-existent cause. This one manifests itself in and throughout all creation but is not absorbed by its creation. Not modified, not altered, not diminished, not changed by its creation. And we can say, how is the soul given the state of the world? I gave you a hint. I think it's within us. I think us as a human race. I think that any evil that is created is misunderstanding, spiritual ignorance, and that going on within human beings. Trees don't fight with each other. The sun doesn't struggle to shine. There's more than enough grains of sand on the earth. There's more than enough air to breathe. And actually someone said if they divided all the money on earth, Equally, we would all have about $5 billion. However, they also said, they also say that within about five years, we'd have exactly what we have now. You can think about why that's true. So, we're the variable if it's in us, it's the good news and the bad news. Because what it means is that our problems are our doing, collectively speaking. But it also means that the solutions also lie within us. And Wayne Dyer, we all know who he was. I got to meet him too. Wonderful man. He's moved on to a new dimension somewhere. He said, loving people live in a loving world. Hostile people live in a hostile world. Same world. How come? And he went on to say in an article when he was interviewed, he said, the truth about humanity and life is what it has always been. We're still more magnificent than we can ever know. Each and every one of us. The answers we seek are indelibly within us, waiting, awaiting our receptivity. Our highest aspiration is no farther away than a new idea in consciousness. Life is inherently perfect and abundant and whole. Our lives can be anything we want them to be. The questions for the next millennium will be answered in how we live each day, each moment. It's up to us. And Albert Einstein said, there are two ways to live your life. One is though nothing is a miracle, and one is though everything is a miracle. So, we have an amazing, amazing power. It is not to control things around us. I have 
song that I keep, keeps running through my head about doing good in the world, and it says, I can't do all the world the good needs, but the world needs all the good I can do. So we are instruments of good in the world as we choose to be. But we mustn't neglect ourselves in the process. And by that I mean keeping ourselves whole, keeping ourselves in peace, keeping ourselves in love, keeping ourselves in connection with that divinity that is within us. That's where the connection is anyway. And it's not about bringing it in, it's about letting it out. And we can do that. Ernest Holmes, again, in this thing called Life, said, there is a universal wholeness seeking expression through everything. We are calling, we call it simply life. The religionist calls it God. The philosopher calls it reality. Life is infinite energy coupled with limitless creative imagination. It is the invisible essence and substance of every visible form. Its nature is goodness, truth, wisdom, and beauty, as well as energy and imagination. Our highest satisfaction comes from a sense of conscious union with this invisible life. All human endeavor is an attempt to get back to first principles, to find such an inward wholeness that all sense of fear, doubt, and uncertainty vanishes. And isn't that what we are all after anyway? And a sense of calm and peace, and a sense of safety and harmony beyond ourselves even. And the reason we deeply care when something happens to anyone else in the world that is adverse is because we are all connected. We are all connected through consciousness and through the spiritual divinity that we share. So what can we do? I was fond of giving homework, so I'm going to give you homework this morning. I'm not doing homework yet, but I can tell you a few things that you can try to do. We can cultivate a faith in this reality, and I say cavity oil reality, of God being everywhere present, which means right where I am always, and operating in every situation, even the most difficult to accept. We can cultivate a faith in the, that reality. The ultimate divine presence and power is right here, right now. It is this in which we live, move, and have our being. The more we immerse or engage ourselves in knowing this, the more we will see it in ourselves, in others, and in our experience. This is the nature of faith and the reality of spiritual law. Here's an exercise, again, suggested by Ernest Holmes in this thing called life. He said, someday when you are confused, try this simple experiment. Sit down quietly and say, the peace of God is at the center of my being. I am the consciousness of this peace. I enter into this peace. This peace moves out from me in all directions. It calms the troubled waters of my experience. It heals everything it contacts. There is nothing but peace. I rejoice in this peace. I permit this peace to enter my soul, to fill me with calm, to inspire me with confidence. I know that this peace goes before me and makes, makes perfect, plain, and straight my way. Try it. He said, sit in the silence of your thought until you see through the confusion. You will soon discover that just as the sun dissipates the fog, so your sense of peace will per per penetrate the wall of confusion. Peace already is. We merely fail to recognize it. And for us, as beings with choice, we choose. I say that over and over again to you, but I will continue to say it. We can choose peace. We can choose love. In every instance, we can choose kindness. We can choose compassion. We can choose non-judgmental living. Ooh. And here's your home. You think you can do it quickly. You can be open to new ideas. You can be open to new ideas. You can try new things. Dare to try new things. Break out of that rut. Move out of your comfort zone. Allow yourself to grow and expand. Experiment, live, and dance. Try new things. We can take it one day at a time each day, reveling in the day, and all that it offers to us. That 
vast secret to mast mastery, clarity, focus, and freedom. We can praise more and criticize less ourselves and others. And we can love more. We can love everything. Yourself, others, the world. Look for what is good. You will find it. We can also lighten up. We can take ourselves more lightly. You can still take what you do seriously. Nothing is that critical, however. And everything is okay. Everything is good. And life flows. The days flow. Everything. We're on this spinning orb, hurtling through space. We can live more simply. That doesn't mean unloading all your possessions necessarily. That just means approaching things simply. It's not about it's about approach. It's looking look for solutions. Expect the best. Be flexible. Kind of go with the flow kind of thing. Live in the moment. You don't need to carry the burdens of the entire world. It's not that we don't care. But I've said it before, if we move ourselves to a place that is at the level of energy of the problem that we become part of the problem. We need to keep our energy, our attitude, our consciousness elevated in a place of peace and love and joy. And we will heal the world. You can make spiritual, your spiritual life a high priority we were talking in that group about theism versus atheism and all the kinds of theism, and that discussion's just begun. You'll have more of them. It was a wonderful discussion. Everyone has their own journey, their own search for what's true and real and right. And the search is important. So we can do that. We can make, we can find a spiritual practice that means something to us, that is good for us, and then do it, do it. And where is God? Right here and right now, closer than hands, nearer than breathing. Please know that and begin your relationship with the infinite here and now. It is your choice. The bottom line is that it truly is up to us. No good can come to us in spite of ourselves. We must believe it and accept it. For it to be. We must cooperate with life for life to cooperate with us. It is all here. Wholeness, paradise, eat for the taking. But we must look with eyes that see. We must live in a state of gratitude and acceptance. There is so much that we have to be grateful for. We can be grateful that we can be here this morning. That, I, that we can speak freely about these things. In some countries, we can't. It can't be done. We can know that that's the future of the world, but at least we have it here now. We must trust life and revel in it. Then we allow it to revel in us and in our very experience. Now, perhaps other people will think you're weird if you do this. But you'll be so happy you won't care. <laughs> and what's worse than that? Hey, call me weird. And you will be a shining example for others. And I leave yourself with this last thing. I'm going to leave you today with this last thing from Ernest Holmes. Again, from this thing called life. Meet every doubt that enters your mind with greater faith. Meet every confusion with a deeper sense of calm. Take the time to do this. Arrange with yourself to give yourself this time. Start your day with peace, and you will live it in peace. Peace is the power at the heart of God, and God is in you even as he is in everything. Let's do it together. You are magnificent beings, and I love you.